Hi, I'm Nicholas Dwork, and today I'll be talking about an introduction to electric circuit elements. Our discussion starts with the Bohr model of the atom. So in the nucleus of the atom, there are a set of protons depicted by these red disks here. And so changing the number of protons changes the element. One proton is a hydrogen atom, two protons is a helium atom, etc. Also in the nucleus of an atom, are neutrons, depicted by these blue circles here. Changing the number of neutrons in an atom changes the isotope. And finally, the last thing that we need in our model of an atom is electrons. Electrons orbit the nucleus, as shown here. And the different orbits represent different energy levels. The orbit closest to the nucleus of the atom is an electron without very much energy and it's most attracted by the nucleus. The orbits farther away have electrons with higher energy. And so there's this concept of ionization energy, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom. And so the electrons in the outermost shell, or the valence shell, are easiest to pry off. Because they have so much energy already, you don't have to add a whole lot to get them to move away from the atom. Atoms with particularly low energy levels are called conductors, and in particular metals are conductors. They have a low ionization energy, so it's very easy to add just a little bit of energy and pry an electron off, as depicted in this picture here. Here again I'm showing an atom. I'm depicting the nucleus just with a black dot, and I'm showing only the valence shell, that is the outermost shell with an electron orbiting around the nucleus of the atom. And what I'll do is place this atom in an external electric field. This is the energy required to pry the electron away from the atom, as shown here. Now, the atom is in a slightly lower energy state if there is indeed an electron in its valence shell. So it's going to attract an electron from the left into its valence shell, as shown. Okay, here I've got a set of atoms, of metal atoms. They're aligned with each other. And when I place it in an electric field now, what will happen is a chain reaction, as shown here. So the electrons move one to the other of these atoms. And what I'm showing you here a metal atom placed next to each other in sequence like this is a wire. And the phenomenon where an electron travels along the wire in a chain reaction is called current. So here's a picture of a wire, or some wires. Uh, the metal part is the conductive part. These wires are sheathed in an insulator. An insulator is an atom that has a very high ionization energy. That's, that is, it takes a lot of energy to pry an electron off. So electrons don't like to travel through insulators. They'd much rather travel through conductors. And we wrap our wires in insulators so that they don't short if you lay one on top of each other, and they don't shock you if you happen to touch one. A resistor is a bad wire in a sense. It's a wire, but it takes more energy to get the electrons to travel through the resistor. And they can be made by combining a conductor, for example carbon, with an insulator, for example ceramic. By mixing more of the insulator in, it becomes harder to get electrons to move through the resistor. So by adding more of the insulator, you increase the resistance. Here is a picture of a battery. It has a positive and a negative terminal. And now I'm going to draw wires. We represent wires just with black lines. And here is the symbol for a resistor of resistance R. And when we put this resistor in here, the two terminals of the battery are connected through the resistor. Another way to say that is that there's an electric field placed across this resistor. And so this causes a current. The electrons travel counterclockwise in this example. But for historical reasons, we denote current traveling in the opposite direction of the movement of electrons. And we denote it with I. There's a relationship that relates the voltage, the current, and the resistance. It's called Ohm's law, and it's V equals IR. 
That is, voltage is equal to current times resistance. So, for a given resistor, if the voltage goes up, the current goes up. Here's a picture of a resistor. It's wrapped in an insulator, that is, the resistor is encased in ceramic, and then there are colored lines drawn on it. And those lines are a color code that tells you what the resistance of that resistor is. There's a common resistor found in households, an electric stovetop. As the current goes through a resistor, energy is dissipated, and that energy is dissipated in the form of heat. And so all this stovetop is is a resistor, and when you apply a voltage, current goes through the resistor, making the resistor get hot, and as you up the voltage, the resistor gets hotter. And that's what you're doing when you're turning the dial of an electric stovetop. Okay, we've gone through wires and resistors. Let's talk about another element. We're going to discuss a capacitor. On the left is a battery. On the upper left is a switch. That is, I've disconnected the wire. On the upper right is a resistor. And then on the right, in this red circle, is the capacitor. A capacitor is two plates separated. When we flip the switch, an electron from this top plate is going to move with the chain reaction onto this bottom plate. And what will remain in the top plate is the absence of an electron, or a hole, which we denote by a plus sign. And so now there's a charge across the two plates of this capacitor. And this happens again and again and again until eventually the voltage across the capacitor is very close to the voltage of the battery. Now we like to place capacitors inside circuits, and if we separated them by air, they'd be quite fragile. If you were playing with your Nintendo DS or something, you got frustrated and shook it. The metal plates might jiggle around and touch each other, and then you don't have a capacitor, you have a wire. So rather than separating them by air, we usually use an insulator between the two plates. Here's a circuit for a capacitor. The current in this circuit is traveling in a clockwise direction. The capacitance C of a capacitor is equal to the charge on, across the plates divided by the voltage placed across the capacitor. And so the better capacitor stores more charge across it for a given voltage. The current traveling through a capacitor is dictated by this differential equation here. Here's an early version of a capacitor. People thought that jars were used for storing things. They wanted to store charge, and so they used a jar. They placed a plate on the outside, a plate on the inside, and the glass was used as the insulation between the capacitive plates. And here is a whole bunch of laden jars strung together. This is a very early version of a battery. Here's what a capacitor looks like today. You'll find many of them in common circuits. For example, if you open up your television, you'll see many of these capacitors. Here's what it looks like if you open one up, and you can see the metal sheet and the insulation. And finally, here's a much smaller capacitor. Let's review capacitors one more time. Here I have two conductors separated by an insulator. This is still a capacitor. And the switch is open, so this circuit is not connected. In the lower conductor and the upper conductor, there are many free electrons. And when we close this switch, these electrons will gather near the top of the bottom conductor. And consequently, holes will gather near the bottom of the top conductor. OK, now we're going to change this a little bit. In the bottom, instead of using a conductor, I'll use a semiconductor. A semiconductor is like a conductor in that you can take an electron out of its valence shell, but it requires more energy to do so. So it's not as good a conductor as a conductor. This is still a capacitor, but it's not as effective. There are fewer free electrons. And so when we close the switch, we still get a gathering of electrons in the semiconductor and holes in the conductor, but not as many as before. So it's, a, its capacitance is not as high. Now, what does this buildup of electrons look like? Well, hopefully you remember it looks like a wire. 
So when the switch is open, we don't have a wire present. But when we close the switch and get this build up, we do. So we now know how to make a wire appear and disappear. I'm going to add two terminals to this device. I'm going to add a conductor on the left called the source, and I'm going to add a conductor on the right called the drain. And when voltage is not applied to the gate, there's no wire. There's no way to get current from the source to the drain. However, if we close the circuit, if we apply voltage to the gate, we get a wire. And now we can get current from the source to the drain. So this works a whole lot like a faucet. If you don't apply a voltage to the gate, it's like turning off the faucet and you don't get any water through the pipe. If you do apply a voltage to the gate, it's like opening up the faucet and you get current going through the pipe. And this device is called a field effect transistor, a FET transistor. Here's what a FET transistor looks like. This is one that you can buy individually packaged. They make them much, much smaller than this. Here's a electron microscope scan of a FET transistor. And you can see that the gate on top, the semiconductor on bottom, the insulation layer between them, there's only four nanometers of insulation layer between them. And you see the source on the left and the drain on the right. You might ask how many transistors are in a computer chip these days. There are 1.4 billion transistors in an Intel i7 processor. This is the symbol of a FET transistor in a circuit. The source is on top, the drain is on bottom, and the gate is on the left. And now I'm going to place this transistor in a circuit this circuit. And we're going to try to figure out what this circuit does. So what is out if in is zero volts? Well, if in is zero volts, we have turned the faucet off. There's no wire at the transistor. So it's like this portion of the circuit is gone. And if we assume very little current or no current, then there's no voltage drop across the resistor and out is 5 volts. Now, what is out if in is 5 volts? Well, if in is 5 volts, the transistor is effectively a wire, and out is connected through a wire directly to ground, or 0 volts. And so there's no reason for out to fight with the resistor to try to get to 5 volts when it has a direct connection to 0 volts. So in this situation, it's like the top part of the circuit is gone, and out is zero volts. This circuit has a special name and symbol. It's called an inverter or a NOT gate, and this is its symbol. Now, rather than saying in is five volts, we say in equals one. And rather than saying in is zero volts, we say in equals zero. And so we'll use the symbols 1 and 0 instead of saying the voltage of the terminal. And now we'll make a table called a truth table that completely depicts the operation of this gate. When in is 1, out is 0. And when in is 0, out is 1. Okay, let's go with a slightly more complicated circuit. And we'll try to figure out what this circuit does. In the first situation, A and B are both 0. To make this easier, I'm going to label the transistors. Well, if A and B are both zero, then transistors 1 and 2 are both off. And transistors 3 and 4 are both on. So out has paths directly to ground. Therefore, out is zero. What happens if A is zero and B is one? Well, if B is 1, then transistor 2 is on, but since A is 0, transistor 1 is off. So out does not have a path to 5 volts. It, does, it is not connected to 5 volts through a wire. And since A is 0, transistor 3 is on. Therefore, out is connected to ground through a wire. Therefore, in this situation, out is again 0. It's connected directly to ground. Similarly, for if A is 1 and B is 0, and now if A is 1 and B is 1, both transistors 1 and 2 are on, and both transistors 3 and 4 are off. Since 3 and 4 are off, out does not have a connection to ground. And since 1 and 2 are both on, 
Out is connected through a wire to 5 volts, therefore out is on. In words, we can depict the operation of the circuit as out is on only if A is on and B is on. This circuit is called an AND gate, and it has this special symbol. Let's try another circuit. Again, I'm going to label the transistors to make the discussion easier. And what happens when A and B are both zero? Well, if A is zero and B is zero, both transistors 1 and 2 are off. And since A is zero, transistor 3 is on. And since B is zero, transistor 4 is on. Therefore, out is connected directly to ground through a wire. Therefore, out is zero. If A is 0 and B is 1, what happens? Well, since B is 1, transistor 2 is turned on. So out is connected through 5 volts through the wire that is transistor 2. Since B is 1, transistor 4 is off. So out is not connected to ground. Therefore, in this situation, out is 5 volts, or 1. Similarly, for if A is 1 and B is 0, and finally, if A and B are both 1, both transistors 1 and 2 are on, and both transistors 3 and 4 are off, therefore out is connected directly to 5 volts, and out is 1. In words, we can say that out is on if A is on or B is on. And so this circuit is called an OR gate. If 2 has a special symbol, this is it. We will now design a circuit for a robot. This is the robot that we're going to be working with. It has two powered wheels. The two wheels on the side are powered. And the center wheel is free to swivel. If you power both wheels, the robot moves forward. If you power only the right wheel, then the robot turns left. And if you power only the left wheel, then the robot turns right. This robot has three sensors on it. One sensor indicates if there's a wall to the left, one sensor indicates if there's a wall to the right, and one sensor indicates if there's a wall in front. This is the path that we want our robot to travel. So we want it to go forward until it hits a wall, it sees a wall in front and a wall to the right, therefore we want it to turn left, then we want it to travel forward until it hits a wall, it sees a wall in front and a wall to the left, therefore we want it to turn right, and then travel forward again until it gets to the finish. So let's make a truth table describing this phenomenon. We have three sensors, left, front, and right, and we have two motors, left and right. The first situation we'll consider is if there's a wall to the left and a wall to the right, but there's no wall in front. So the sensors on left and right are on, but the sensor for front is off. In this situation, we want the robot to travel forward. So we want both motors powered, the left motor and the right motor. The other two situations we'll consider if there's no wall to the left or if there's no wall to the right. So if there's no wall to the left, then the left sensor is off and the front and right sensors are both on. In this situation, we want the robot to turn left, which means we want the left motor to stay off, but we want the right motor to be turned on. And similarly, if there's no wall to the right, we want the left motor to be turned on, and we want the right motor to be turned off. Okay, this is the truth table that we need to satisfy with our circuit. Our inputs are the sensors, left, front, and right, and our outputs are the motors, left, and right. We're going to create the circuit that goes in between these terminals. We'll focus just on the left motor for now. And so how do we do this? Well, look at the first situation. We want the left motor turned on if the left sensor is on, the front sensor is off, and the right sensor is on. So let's get focus on just those first two aspects. If the left sensor is on and the front sensor is off, notice that I used the word AND. This indicates that we want to use an AND gate, and that's what we'll do. This AND gate has an output that's on if the left sensor is on and the front sensor is off. Now for this first situation, we also need the right sensor to be turned on. So we can combine the output of this AND gate with another AND gate as so. And now the output here 
is on only if the left sensor is on and the front sensor is off and the right sensor is on. And so that's the first situation. What's the other situation that the left motor is turned on? Well, if the left sensor is on and the front sensor is on and the right sensor is off, then the left motor is also turned on. So here's the circuit for that. Okay, so if either of these outputs are on, then we want the left motor to be turned on. That is, if the top output is on or the bottom output is on, we want the left motor to be turned on. Notice I used the word or. This indicates that we want to use an OR gate as so. Okay, and that's the circuit for the left motor. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out the circuit for the right motor. And then I'll challenge you. Do we really need all of this circuitry? Could we make a simpler circuit to have the same functionality? As a review of this presentation, we have discussed the Bohr model of an atom. We used this model to realize how wires and resistors work. We extended our understanding to include capacitors. We saw that a FET transistor is based on capacitors. We used FET transistors to define logic gates. And we used logic gates to create a digital circuit for a robot. Thank you for your attention.